Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to another in the series of the Layer Education Tea Talks. This talk is going up on behalf of Eddie Sange Azza. Uh, my name is Doug Tucker, and this afternoon we'll be talking all about motivation. Uh, as you can see on the screen, motivation, its roots, its fruits, and how to reboot. I don't know where I get these titles from, but basically we'll be talking about where motivation comes from, um, how it can benefit us to have motivated students in our classes, though that may be obvious. And if you're stuck in a situation where you feel that you haven't got that situation of motivated students in your class, how you can reboot, kickstart, and get the whole process going. We're looking especially here at the situation in the Trocello and secondary school classes, so the ages of about 14 upwards. So let's start by having a look at the cycle of motivation, where it starts, where it comes from, and how we can keep it going, or how it keeps itself going. So we start, obviously, very often with extrinsic motivation. Uh, this means it's the teacher who sets the ball rolling by providing something motivating for the students to do in the classroom. There we have extrinsic motivation at the beginning of the cycle. Now, if the students do feel motivated by what you present for them, then their brains start producing that wonderful chemical called dopamine, the neurotransmitter, which has the particular function of helping students, or helping everyone, uh, focus and pay attention. Now, if in the classroom situation students are paying attention due to that flood of dopamine in their brains, it very often means that they will have success in what they are engaged in. And success, as we all know, is a big motivating factor. So here we see the circle start to complete itself. Um, if you're successful, you feel motivated. When you feel motivated, like at the beginning of the cycle, your brain will produce dopamine, you'll be more focused, you'll be more attentive, you'll be enjoying things more, and you'll be hence more motivated to want to look further ahead, come back again, do more of the same. Um, and that is where the motivation starts to change from something extrinsic provided by the teacher to something intrinsic coming from within the student, something that they've recognized they enjoy and they want to do more of. We've completed the cycle, we've changed from extrinsic to intrinsic. It doesn't happen in one lesson, but it does happen in a gradual process if we provide the right inputs and stimuli to get students involved in this cycle. Um, now, as we all know, adolescence can be a difficult time to motivate students how often have you heard adolescent students or your kids at home maybe say that they are bored, I'm bored? It's a typical response, isn't it? Um, but we should bear in mind that adolescents and teenagers are not doing this just to wind us up, although it works extremely well, but they are doing this because it is a natural, truthful reaction to what is happening in their brains at that time. They're not doing it on purpose, they're just being honest about their mental state. Let's take a look at a couple of situations where stimulus and response can be very different in adolescents and adults. Now here's a situation um, done in the laboratory where they gave adult, a group of adults and a group of adolescents a large stimulus, something exciting and engaging and uh, that would grab the attention of the adults and the adolescents under test. Um, the adolescents, as you can see, is the dark blue line. The, ad the adults have the red line. So the adults are instantly engaged by the idea. Their engagement uh, lasts a little while and then drops off and returns to more or less normal levels just above the baseline. The adolescents, on the other hand, are not as immediately engaged, but when they do get engaged, they have double the reaction of the adults. They find this fantastically exciting. Typical adolescent reaction, it's... Uh, slow to catch on, but then it becomes hugely uh, enthusiastic. Um, we can all recognize the syndrome of the excited, engaged teenagers, often in something that they shouldn't be doing, but never mind. Um, and then it drops off slowly, comes back a little bit, and comes down to, again, more or less baseline levels just above, lower than the adults, interestingly there. Um, that's the situation of a large stimulus of an exciting event, Let's take a look at a smaller stimulus. 
something that might happen, for example, in the classroom. So, in the classroom, we provide a, a small stimulus, and we can see that here the adults um, have no real reaction. It's something they've seen before. Um, in fact, the only true reaction is a slight drop in dopamine levels, where perhaps they do recognize that seen this before, been there, done that, nothing new, um, and their uh, dopamine levels do go slightly be below baseline before they recover slightly at the end and come back to just above. Interesting though is the adolescent reaction. They have uh, a sharp drop in attention, then a sharp rise a few seconds later, and then a drastic plummet below, way below baseline for their dopamine levels, which means that their attention is fractured, their interest has gone, and they are feeling, yes, you guessed it, bored. Small stimuli, such as might happen in the classroom, produce a reaction which actually translates in the brain and the chemical production into quite intense boredom in a very short matter of time. And it takes a long time for those dopamine levels to come back to anything like baseline. And as you can see at the end of that second graph, just slightly lower than the adults, even at the end of that stretch. So there we go. Adolescent dopamine levels can be high peaking for something exciting, but they can also drop drastically for something which is not intrinsically exciting um, and take quite a while to come back to baseline levels. When they say they're bored, they really are. The chemicals in their brain are sending them this message. They don't have any say in the matter. Um, so that's the uh, one of the challenges that we have to face in trying to uh, motivate and galvanize adolescent students by providing suitable stimuli over a period of time to keep them motivated and keep them uh, active and active. Um, active and interested, sorry, in what they're doing. Now, one way we can help make sure that this interest and activity is maintained over a period of time is by making sure there are connections connections between you and your students, and connections between the students and each other. But we're very interested here in the particular connection between teacher and student. Um, my main word for this situation, especially when I'm coming into a new situation where I don't know the students, is schmooze. What you need to do is schmooze with your students, by which I basically mean just spend a little time whenever you can in an informal way, making connections, making conversation, having a little chit chat and getting to know your students better. Let me give you the example of a situation that I was in oh, 50, 60, 70 times over the last couple of years where I went and visited um, middle schools in the school sequel this is um, and i did storytelling sessions with kids from the fifth and the sixth year very often with groups of 50 60 70 90 100 students at one point um, and the difference was absolutely remarkable in situations where i did or did not have time to schmooze with the group before we started now, very often the students were there quite early, excited to be there, and I had the chance to walk around among them and greet as many people as possible. And uh, as you can see, that a slap a high five um, in the days where we could make contact with students. Um, it will come again. High fives will come back. Um, and ask as many of them their name as possible and how old they were, etc. Just a little bit of schmoozing. And I tried to remember as many of their names as possible and I tried to use them during the rest of the session. There were other occasions where, for some reason, most of the students arrived late and it was getting too tight to be able to do everything and I didn't have the time to schmooze at the beginning and the difference between the times where I did schmooze and the times where I didn't schmooze and that word is starting to sound very strange now schmooze never mind the difference between the times where I did and the times where I didn't were absolutely remarkable when I did not have the time to schmooze students attention was much less focused on what we were doing and they were much less willing to go along with the whole activity the times where I schmoozed and got to know them and had a laugh and had a chat and slapped some high fives, those were the times when things went best. And that's just five minutes 
at the beginning of a session. Do that every lesson with your much smaller group and get to know them. You'll have a much more accentuated response. Now, this is the basis of a study that was done by uh, the main author of this um, academic article. His name is Hunter Gelbach. He is an educational psychologist. He works at the University of John Hopkins in the United States. And he and a whole bunch of his colleagues, as we can see there at the bottom, um, produced this uh, academic paper called Creating Birds of Similar Feathers, Leveraging Similarity to Improve Teacher-Student Relationships and Academic Achievement. And what they basically did was, the birds of similar feathers idea is to show that we all have things in common. That's the basis of this uh, study and the uh, really the most important thing in their findings is that when we can prove we have things in common with each other, relationships improve and this has a marked effect on academic, academic achievement as well. Really, really interesting study. Um, look it up. You can find um, a questionnaire, which I'll start showing you now, at the um, reference at the bottom of the screen there. So it's all based around a questionnaire. He gave all the, stu he, uh, the students in the study all filled out um, a questionnaire online with questions like these about their free time, what they prefer doing alone uh, with some friends, meeting new people. So questions about their personality and what who the person who they really are. Um, students all answered these questions online, chose one answer, flicked to the next question. There might be something next about activities, free time, leisure, sports, travel, reading, listening to music. Um, students completed these, chose the ones they like to do. There was questions about sports. Which sports event would you like to go to, including I wouldn't go to any of them. I'd give my tickets to someone who actually cared about it. Um, so there's Questions on all sorts of familiar situations, including this one, for example, on the learning situation. How do students learn best? What's your opinion? Um, students filled out this questionnaire, questionnaire online. I think there were 315 students who did this in the study that um, Hunter Gelbach um, produced. And their teachers also did the same questionnaire and answered all the same questions. And of course, all the answers of teachers and students were all logged online. What is interesting then is that the feedback was given to both teachers and students, pointing out all the points where teachers, where the teacher and each individual student had answered the same. And students were able to see where they shared opinions about uh, personality traits, about interest in sports, about leisure activities, about teaching and learning, where they coincided and their views were the same with their teacher. And this is what really creates this new idea for many students is that I do actually have something in common with this teacher who is decades older than me, but we agree on lots of things. We like the same sports, we like the same activities, we have the same ideas, we like the same situations in class, we have things in common. This is a really, really important uh, realization for students to make and for teachers to make, that these students who maybe they feel they have nothing in common with actually do have many touching points of interests and opinions which are exactly the same. It creates a real feeling of relationships and connection, and that feeling of relationship and closer connection leads directly to better academic achievement. Better atmosphere in the classroom, better attention in classes, better academic achievement, especially, and this is really interesting, for what um, Hunter Gelbach termed the most underserved students in the school, who had something like a 60% improvement in relation to their more higher achieving peers. Um, their marks jumped up dramatically by underserved students. He's talking about those who were typically in lower income groups or of uh, minority, uh, ethnic minorities, those who have um, some sort of marginalized situation within the school by making a connection with their teacher, their marks and their attitudes and their relationships all jumped up 
dramatically. Really, really important and fascinating study. We can do the same. The questionnaire that's online that you can see listed at uh, or referenced at the bottom of the screen is not adaptable, but we can adapt it. We can take certain questions from it. We can add questions of our own, uh, questions which might be about sport, sport or food. Food's always popular in Portugal. Music about family, about travel. I recommend not favourite football teams. I'm remembering a situation with my stepdaughter Edna when she was at school and there was one class where the teacher was a very strong supporter of Benfica and she had a colleague in her class who was a very strong supporter of Sporting and all they ever did was argue quite nastily at times about the benefits and the drawbacks of Benfica and Sporting. So I recommend not favourite football teams, but all the other ways that you can make to find connections and things in common with your students. Um, that's the real starting point of motivation, um, and you can build on it from there. So that's my first and perhaps most important recommendation, is to use this questionnaire idea, get your students to fill it in, Feedback to them about all the points that you and they have individually in common, not as a group, but individually, make those individual connections. And that's the start of them starting to see you as a real person and making real leaps forward in relationship, attention and achievement. Now, let's have a look at um, a, a few little, strip, uh, a little clips of video uh, about students around this age. These are eighth and ninth year students and their teachers talking about this whole process. We'll come back and we'll touch on a few of these quotes in a moment, but here's the first one. We're trying to build caring and respect. The teacher is trying to understand who I am and my values as a person. So there we go. First important thing, understanding who I am and my values. That's the basis of the connection you need to make. Next. When that student knows that you care about them, when they know that you're a human, Let's think about that. their academic performance in your class is going to be better. So there we go. If that student recognizes that you care about them, that you recognize them as a human, their academic performance will be better. You may be like, I thought that the teacher speaking was actually a ninth year student at the beginning. He looks incredibly young. Um, but no, that was a teacher expressing his opinion but obviously based on uh, experiences that he's had where recognition of each other as human beings with things in common produces better academic achievement. Here's another. If I'm comfortable around them, then I'm more confident around them and it's easier to ask questions and things like that. There we go. More confident, more comfortable and easier to ask questions and things like that. There we go. That, that's the whole classroom situation summed up, summed up, isn't it? Ask questions and things like that. Be active. Be involved. Get attention. Know that you're making a connection and that your teacher will listen to you. Feeling comfortable. Feeling confident. It's got to be good. Last one. Some teacher I don't always get along with the best, so then sometimes I'm like, I can't do it, so I'm just not going to do it. But when I like the teacher, I want to do their work. I'll be like, I can learn this. Now, I love that. When it's a teacher he doesn't get along with so well, he's like, I'm not going to do it. But when it's a teacher he likes, his whole attitude, he recognizes, his whole attitude changes. He says, I can learn this. I can do it. I can learn this. And there's a real will and, oh look, motivation to actually want to do something and learn from it and enjoy it. Very powerful. So there we go. Make those connections. Uh, prove to yourself and to your students that you are real people with real things in common and that there is uh, a relationship and connection between you and it can have a huge influence on uh, your classroom atmosphere and their academic results as well. Now, um, there are other ways which we can uh, carry this motivation forward in classroom activities and real physical situations 
um, and things we do in class. Um, and I undertook uh, a similar study with a huge sample of two people, um, uh, my partner, Marina, and my stepdaughter, Edna. And I asked them what they disliked in particular about um, on my, uh, for my partner, Marina, who is a, um, a kindergarten teacher. Um, and my daughter, Edna, who at the time was in high school and is now at university. Um, so what they liked about, uh, for Marina, about the Formesange, about the training programs that she has to follow to get her points to, uh, to be able to move up the scale, this legendary scale that was frozen for nine years um, as a teacher. And Marina particularly pinpointed uh, not enjoying classes in her Formesange where all the trainers did was talk and talk and talk very often about themselves and about all the things they'd achieved and the articles they'd written. Um, not giving the students in these Formesange, the Formandus, the opportunity to get involved and express opinions and be active uh, and, and share things. Um, Teachers or formadores who spend all the time just explaining on a very theoretical level leads to tedium, especially because these formations are very often after work um, and she has them between sort of 6 o'clock and 10.30 in the evening. Extremely difficult to keep focused and motivated. Edna, on the other hand, uh, pointed out the fact that she hates those moments in class where she has nothing to do if she finishes before other people and she's just sitting around waiting for feedback to happen or something to be corrected or the next activity to come in. Hating having that time of nothing to do. It's the typical low levels of dopamine where there's no stimulation and dopamine will drop way be be below baseline levels. She also mentioned the particular situation uh, in the first year of her university classes where she had one teacher whose idea of a good teaching technique for a three-hour class was to read to the students from her own book for an hour and a half, then they'd take a break, and then when the students came back, she would give them academic articles to read for the next hour and a half. And then she'd criticise them when the students said that they didn't understand the articles and tell them that their reading level wasn't good enough. As you can guess, that was a little less than motivating on each and every one of those occasions where they spent three hours first listening and then reading with no interaction and no involvement at all. So let's look at what students actually need to do in a classroom situation. I've chosen four things which I believe are fundamental, and the first one is to do stuff, to actually have things to be active and involved with, to be um, producing something or doing something in the lesson. And I put here AEAP, which as you can see is asterisked at the bottom of the screen there, as early, maybe not as soon, but as early as possible in the lesson. The moment they walk through the door, is an opportunity to get students active and doing things. And that's a great step towards knowing that their time is not going to be wasted in this classroom. As soon as they're through the door, they've got something to do. And there are students, many of them, the vast majority, who will thank you for that. Students need to interact. You don't want the students sitting there and their whole lesson is going to be the view of someone's the back of someone's head or the back of the rest of the classroom's heads and the teacher talking at the front. Students need to interact with each other. There needs to be some social aspect. We'll come back to this in just a moment. But interaction is absolutely key. And it's so easy in a language classroom. It should be the, the core of what goes on in a language classroom. Students need to move. Students spend seven or eight hours at school every day and very often they don't move from their seat for several of those hours. In each class, ask your students how often they get up and move around. Rarely. And not only is that demotivating, it's also uncomfortable. And being uncomfortable will lead to a lack of attention and a lack of motivation. 
Students need to move. Simple. Students need to feel involved in the lesson, not that they're just being directed to a series of sort of robotic uh, reactions to stimuli, but they are actually involved and a part of the lesson and, uh, and being influential in that lesson itself. So let's come and have a look at all of these. Um, first here we got a quote from an excellent book. I recommend this book to anyone who's interested in uh, the academic side of um, education and its study and how that translates into the real life classroom. The book is called From the Laboratory to the Classroom, Translating Sci the Science of Learning for Teachers. Excellent book, published in 2017. So here we go, when students are able to immediately put their learning to use in authentic situations, so as early as possible, cannot be stressed too strongly, they are motivated and will persevere with tasks. Motivation produces dopamine. Dopamine produces attention. Attention means that perseverance over a longer period of time is possible. Also very interesting there, the social environment of the classroom also affects motivation. And this is where that wonderful chemical oxytocin comes into play. Um, oxytocin is another of these neurotransmitters in the brain. It's sometimes called the cuddle chemical because um, it has to do with feeling closeness and connection and safety and protection and comfort with the group of people, with your family, with your colleagues, with your friends, with your teacher. In the classroom situation, we can produce this by getting students interacting, involved and feeling supported in the classroom. They've got the connection with you, they're interacting with, interacting with their peers, they're creating connections with the friends and their colleagues around them, and the chemical oxytocin is making them feel good and safe and involved in the whole situation. Oxytocin is another really important one that we can produce in students' brains and they help them feel good and confident and comfortable by socially involving them in the classroom, getting the interaction going. Um, and there's another way that we can get students uh, really involved and active in the classroom um, and that's with the enticement approach. Um, enticement insofar as if the students know that when they enter your English language classroom that A, there's going to be something immediately available for them to be involved and interactive with, um, and B, that it's going to be enjoyable and fun and interactive, um, then that's going to get them into the classroom with a positive frame of mind and ready to be attentive and already before they walk through that door, the dopamine production is starting. If they walk in and they know that on a regular basis they're going to come into the classroom and see something like this on the board. This is just a framework for a simple noughts and crosses game. It could be to revise vocabulary. Behind each question mark you've got a word card or a picture and all they have to do is name the vocabulary item that corresponds to that picture or there's going to be a question for them to answer or there's going to be um, a grammatical transformation for them to do, they're working in teams, they're interacting with their peers, they're providing the answers, they're winning the game. And this can happen in the first moments of the class. If they walk in and they see this on the board, then that's an immediate stimulus and an immediate signal to, yes, we've got something to do. It's going to be engaging and enjoyable. Um, and this can be part of their regular habit of expecting good things to happen in your English language classroom. Building habits like this um, are a great way to get students into the class. There's a story in a book I read by Chip and Dan Heath. Um, I think it was the book they wrote. They wrote in several excellent books, but they wrote one called Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard. And it was had a chapter talking about difficult students. And there was one uh, story they told about difficult students the, the two cool for school guys who used to hang around outside the classroom until after the lesson had already started and then make a point of coming in late and being cool and being, oh, I didn't realise the time. Um, and how did the teacher get around that? What he did was he installed a sofa in his classroom. Not always easy to do, I know, but it's a nice story. 
at the front of the classroom, a sofa where, you know, they could come in, sit around, be cool, and he let them sit there. If the, the per first people to arrive could sit on that sofa and stay there for the lesson. And the cool kids thought this was brilliant. So they would come early to claim the sofa for themselves and sit and chill and relax and be cool before the lesson started. And then when the teacher came in, they could stay there. And that meant the teacher had those cool kids in the classroom early, feeling good and willing to engage just by the simple fact of enticing them into the classroom. So things like this on the board, getting your students uh, into the regular habit of knowing that there's going to be something engaging to happen in the first moments of your class, not writing the summary of the lesson, that's not engaging. Leave that till later. Leave that till after the end of the class, or at the end of the class, write a summary of what's happened, not the first moments in the class writing a summary of what's going to happen, that's not engaging. If the students come in and they see on the board the phrase, change places, if they know that one of their favourite games, it's one of my students' favourite games, is going to be uh, the first activity they're going to do. What happens is I will start off the game by saying to the students, change places if you ate pizza last night, change places if you watched um, Netflix last night, change places if you listened to some music last night to practice the past tense. Every student who did do the activity that I mentioned has to stand up from their chair and move to a different one. And the person who is left standing at the end, the last person to sit down, has to come to the first class and carry on giving you instructions. Change places if, and it's five minutes of listening and reacting and laughing and moving, and uh, it's intense activity. It gets everyone in a good mood, and they go back to their places, and we continue the lesson as normal. But it's a very, very quick motivating activity at the beginning of the lesson. And as soon as they walk in and they see this phrase on the board, they know that the first few minutes of this lesson are going to be interesting. On the other hand, if you've got a more cerebral class who like things to, uh, to think about and discuss and to reflect upon, I've also had classes where I would put on the board a quotation. Um, you can find lists of these on the internet, quotations for discussion in class. Um, here is one, I, I believe this is by Einstein, though I can't remember now. But everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. In pairs, discuss, do you agree or not? Uh, why, why not? You've got three minutes and then I'd like to hear your opinions. And they have the chance to express themselves, to give their opinions, to make connections, to interact. Some of them may not do this in English, but they are at the same time making these relationships, making these connections, having this interaction, producing the oxytocin. And so English or Portuguese, you can encourage as much English as possible. I think it's a valid activity. And it's the sort of thing that some classes really enjoy, this opportunity to, to reflect on something a little philosophical um, and to express their opinions. Right at the beginning of the class, they can come in and have something interesting and challenging to talk about. These are the sort of things that will get them used to the idea that interesting things happen early in English classes. And there's always something for them to do as soon as they come in the door. That's a motivating factor in itself. Now, here on the class is a list of activities which I use on a regular basis. Activities for uh, the practice or the presentation, the practice, not the presentation, of... Um, of language or uh, other areas of language, um, vocabulary, grammar, anything you like. Um, and my question to you is, do these activities give you, you the opportunity as a teacher to get your students involved and active early? Is it E for early? Is it an I for interaction? Are these interactive activities? Do they get the students talking to each other? And is there an M for movement? Do the students have a chance to move with these activities and get up out of their seats where they've been sitting for so many hours already and have a chance to move around and get a little relief from their hard wooden chairs? Here's a quick example. The change places if game we just, we just mentioned can be E for early. It can happen right at the beginning of the class. I normally do play it at the beginning of the class. 
It has I for interaction, because it starts with interaction between me and the students, my prompt and their reaction, and then it carries on with other students providing the prompt and the stimulus and the whole class reacting, so that's intense interaction. And of course, it has the opportunity for movement, because students are standing up, moving around, finding a different place, having fun, bumping into each other. Um, and so the opportunity for movement is built into this game. So I recommend now that you pause the video and take a minute or two to think about the other activities that I've got on the board. Hopefully there'll be familiar activities to you um, and decide if they are E for early um, place in the, in the classroom, in, the, in, in your lesson. Do they happen early? Can they happen early? Is there an I for interaction? And is there an M for movement? Is movement involved in these activities? There's just one I'd like to clarify. I put it here because it's one of my favorite, favorite activities. Lexical furniture is an activity where the students are given a list of vocabulary that you've studied recently especially things they might have missed out on in readings or in listening, this interesting vocabulary you want to bring back and, and uh, um, direct their attention to again. Um, and what they have to do with this, act with this vocabulary is do a quick sketch of their house in 30 seconds, very, very quickly, bedroom, bedroom, living room, kitchen, uh, dining room, uh, bathroom, that's it done and they have to decide a place in their house for each of these words. There must be a connection somehow between the word that you've given them and somewhere in their house. They have three or four minutes to do that and then they compare their ideas with a partner or in small groups of three or four. It's an intensely personal activity Everyone's sharing things about their own lives, about their own houses, about their own opinions. They're being inventive and creative. Um, and it's, it's an activity which I've never had a fail with, with any group in any level, as long as they've got enough language to provide the, the explanation. I put this word in my bedroom because... So that's one of my favorite activities. Might not be so familiar. Have a look at the others, pause the video, um, and then I'll show you my results for the early interactive or movement factors. Okay, I'm presuming you paused the video, and now I'm going to show you my answers. So, for example, telephone can be another one which is, at the beginning of the lesson, involving interaction, Telephone where there are whispered sentences passed down a line until the first until the last person has to interpret it and write it down and see how close it was to the original. It involves movement as well because it involves getting up and out of their seats and forming a line and whispering in each other's ears. Questions around the walls. Um, instead of having them in their books or on the board, they have to walk around the walls and read the questions to answer from their text. Change places, we've talked about mime games where they're miming activities and, and different vocabulary, etc. Noughts and crosses, we've talked about already. Find someone who, where they're mingling and walking around the classroom, can happen again at the beginning of the lesson if it's recycling something from the last lesson. It involves intense interaction, lots of lots of questions and answers, and it involves moving around the classroom. Just putting your hands up or down to indicate yes or no or true or false provides an extra way to involve movement in the class and interaction to showing your answers in a physical manner rather than just sitting there and ticking boxes in your book. Pictionary is a great one. It can be done right at the beginning to revise vocabulary. Uh, it involves guessing and interaction and movement and standing up and moving to the board. All of these can be involved or can be used to, nearly all can be used to have quite intense interaction, often a movement uh, factor involved, and many of them can be done at the beginning of the lesson to provide that early impulse to get out of their seats, involved, interacting, and having a good time in the first seconds of your English class. So there we go, that's something to reflect on. Um, if you're not sure about any of these activities, leave a note or a question in the comments below the video and I'll do my best to get back to you. Finally, I want to talk about choice. Choice is an incredibly important factor to get students involved in the class. We're talking about students feeling involved in the classroom.
Not just because they're active, but because they actually have uh, an opinion and an influence on what happens in the classroom. If you can give the students choice of how they want to do things at various different points of the lesson, that's the best and easiest and most direct way to give them choice in what happens in their time with you. This can be very similar. It can be uh, a choice between doing something individually, in a pair or with a group, ask the students which they want to do. It can be binary choices. Uh, do you want to do this in a written format or in a spoken format? Do you want to write down the answers? Do you want to share the answers with a partner? Binary choices, yes or no, these work well for adolescent students very much in a binary mindset. Um, do you want to speak from notes or text, or do you want to do it from memory when they're making a presentation? Um, if we're watching a video, do you want English subtitles? Do you want Portuguese subtitles? Or do you want no subtitles at all? Give them the choice. How far do they want to challenge themselves? Get a class consensus. Which order do you want to do these activities in? Should we do the reading first and then the speaking, or the listening and then the reading and then the speaking, or the speaking first and then let that inform our reading and listening? get the students to, to experiment and to play around with doing things in a different order. Give them the choice. We've only got time for one more activity, guys. Uh, which one should we do? A, B or C? Should we do the speaking? Should we do the reading? Should we do the game? Game, teacher, game! But give them the choice. Which one do they want to do? Hand it over to them. Let them influence the lesson. You're going to do a very similar activity or the same activity again. Do you want to do it with the same person again or do you want to change? Well, you probably want to change, wouldn't you? And it's a great way to get an extra layer of practice in to get them to do the same activity again with someone different and share ideas with someone different, um, but give them the choice. Read silently or read aloud. Lots of students like reading aloud. I don't really understand it, but it seems to be something that they like to practice. Um, give them the choice. Which way do they want to do it? and make it completely open-ended if you like. How shall we do this next activity? What do you think? Um, any ideas how we can do this best? And they've got enough experience already of the classroom and of approaches and of activities to be able to give some good ideas about how they would like to do it, how they would like to record the vocabulary, how they would like to set up the speaking, how they would like to approach this new topic, um, get their opinions. Get them involved, feeling involved. And choice is a great way to do that. Um, here's another quote from that great book, From the Laboratory to the Classroom. Um, when students are given choices in their learning, they learn more and become more autonomous. They learn more. Academic achievement is actually influenced by the very fact of having choice. Um, sustained interest in the task or activity, just by giving them choices. If they choose to do it in a particular way, they are more likely to maintain and sustain their interest in the activity than if you told them how they, how they had to do it. It might be the same thing. They might choose the way that you already wanted to do it. But if they choose it, they'll be attentive for longer. Um, and so, just to round up now, Here's a little checklist. I've named it the MICE checklist. I managed to find an acronym. Yay, I love acronyms. Um, and this is the MICE acronym for a checklist for your classes. And it says, does my lesson include M for movement? Do I, am I going to give the students a chance to get out of their seats and move around and have a break from those hours and hours spent sitting in lessons? They'll thank you for it. Does my lesson include interaction, that all-important interaction to produce the oxytocin, to get students involved in and relating and connecting to you and the peers around them? Does my lesson involve or include choice? Are there moments in the lesson where I'm going to offer the students the choice of how they want to do it, a binary choice or a multi-choice or an open choice? And also, very importantly, do I feel, here's the E, do I feel enthusiastic about my lesson? Because if you don't feel enthusiastic, and we know this for a fact, don't we? But if you go into a lesson with something that you think you're not going to enjoy, that will almost inevitably translate into student uh, disengagement. And they'll start turning off because they'll sense this from you and your lack of enthusiasm about it. So if you don't feel enthusiastic about your lesson, 
do something about it. There's got to be some way you can tweak it or change it to get it to a point where you think, ah, yeah, actually, this is going to be good. I think my students are going to enjoy this. I think I've got something here which is really going to work. Ken Wilson, in, in a great um, blog that he has, you can see the address there, Ken Wilson ELT at wordpress.com, um, has this quote about teacher enthusiasm, the single most important factor in student motivation. Now, that's the, uh, the opinion of one person, a bit of a guru in terms of English language teaching, Ken Wilson, but uh, there's also uh, a quote from a study here carried out by uh, another academic education specialist. The enthusiasm of the educators statistically predicted their students' rating of enjoyment and perceived value in the subject matter, which means basically that if the teacher likes the lesson, the students will as well. And that will all build onto motivation. But it has to be something that the teacher comes in to enthusiastic about and then that transmits to the students. Now, Ken Wilson, um, as I said, a bit of a guru in English language teaching. And uh, on his blog, he has a very, very interesting article all about motivating students, especially teenage students. And one of the first things that he lists as uh, an approach that he recommends you take is what he calls using or deploying your big guns. The big guns for Ken Wilson, in each class you have students who are good in that subject and so are a model for the others. They might not just be good, but they're probably also the big guns of people who are liked by the others in the group, who are respected by their colleagues, who have some sort of standing. And so this combination of being good at what they do and being liked and respected by their colleagues makes them the big guns of the classroom who can influence um, and, and infuse the others to move forward and to, and to become involved and active in the, in the lesson. If, if the big guns, and you can actually take aside your big guns and say, your role in my class is to get people involved and to encourage and to praise and to, and to lead and to provide a model for the others who are having more difficulty, that's deploying your big guns. Now, that's his recommendation to improve student motivation. I'm thinking of you as teachers, and I'm guessing that if you are here watching this video on a Saturday afternoon or whatever time you're watching it, and that you've taken your own free time to invest in hearing some ideas from me about how to improve your students' motivation, then you are probably not a teacher who is under-motivated yourself. In fact, I would reckon that in this situation, within the group of teachers, that you are the big guns. You are the people that I, perhaps now, taking the Ken Wilson, Wilson role, would like to send out into the teaching world and you are the ones who are going to lead the way to share your ideas, to motivate others, to share activities and um, point out successes and um, experiments that you've done to improve the motivation of your students and pass this on to your colleagues. You're the big guns now. You're the ones who can go out and make a difference with your other colleagues and improve their teaching and working life. They'll thank you for it. Go get them, cowboy. This, this was not my idea. I don't know where this uh, visual came from. I think this was Louisa who put this on. Thank you, Louisa. Um, it's quite cute. Anyway, that's the end of the session. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you found some useful ideas. As I said, if you have any questions or comments, please uh, put them in the comment section below the video. I think there will be one. Um, and I will do my best to get back to you and answer when I can. Thank you. Have a good rest of the afternoon.